Good afternoon. This is Media Center Ukraine, Odessa, and we are happy to have with us the Minister of Defense of Ukraine, Oleksiy Reznikov, and together with the Minister of Defense of the Kingdom of Sweden, Paul Jonsson, we are happy to see you here, Mr. Johnson, as well. So let's get started. The floor is yours, two ministries. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy uh, to see those uh, whom I saw last time here. And uh, this is a good tradition when my colleagues, um, the ministers of defense of our allies, come to Ukraine, not only to our capital, Kyiv, but also to the southern regions of Ukraine. Today, with Mr. Jonsson, before Odessa, we had already visited Mykolaiv and Mykolaiv Oblast, and even for me, that was a very interesting day. Today, we had an opportunity to visit today with Mr. Paul Jonsson, the vessel on our ship repair factory. And actually, there are four vessels like that uh, that are produced in Mykolaiv. They were constructed uh, with the same aim. They were very powerful vessels. One of them, one of the cruisers is in Mykolaiv, and the different one is on the bottom of the Black Sea, and uh, it is an ex-flagship of the Russian fleet, the cruiser Moscow. Admiral Neish Papa was uh, our guide uh, today, and we have seen uh, actually uh, what actually parts um, of the vessel of the Moscow cruiser were damaged by our Neptune system. And uh, we have started uh, discussing with the Mr. Jonsson the possibility of uh, establishing the Museum of Victory. Uh, there were, will be two localities, uh, uh, the museum itself and also uh, the diving sport at the Black Sea, the sunk cruiser. We have had also opportunity to see the damages of the civil infrastructure by Russian forces, including the university, the hospital, school, and hotel. So they do not target military objects, but the peaceful population of Ukraine, and we've been able to see this today. We've also heard the real stories of real people from Mykolaiv, starting from the deputy head uh, of Odessa military administration, Mr. Marina, and uh, the general Marchenko, uh, who have been staying there since the first day of the full-scale war. And I'm really happy that um, Sweden is the friend of Ukraine and is the um, member to the anti kremlin coalition club. Sweden has uh, the same spirit and even the same colors of uh, the flag, yellow and blue. And um, we will discuss uh, with Mr. Jornsson the further support of Ukraine uh, from Sweden, from the Kingdom of Sweden. We have been receiving support of the country of that country since the first day, and uh, it will be become only stronger. And uh, Sweden uh, is a very technologically developed country. That's why the means uh, that are provided uh, by our friends uh, from Sweden are very effective at the battlefield. For us, from the political point of view, it's very important uh, to understand uh, that the Sweden will be uh, will keep the presidency in the EU, and this means uh, that the leadership of the Kingdom of Sweden will be important not only in the framework of our bilateral relations, but also at the whole level of the EU. And uh, I know the position of uh, Mr. Jonsson that they will continue supporting us without any limitations. That's why I would like to thank once more Mr. Jonsson for the visit. Uh, we will continue our work today. We will discuss um, our bilateral relations. And now we'll give the floor to Mr. Jonsson. Thank you very much, Mr. Resnikov, and thank you both for inviting me to Ukraine. My first international call was with you, and my prime minister's first call was with uh, President Zelensky. I think that's an expression of uh, the top priority that uh, the Swedish, new Swedish government is giving on supporting Ukraine. 
I also like to express my deep gratitude also to the, the armed forces of, the, of uh, Ukraine, which are, of course, fighting for securing uh, Ukraine's freedom and independence and territorial integrity, but, of course, also uh, securing Europe and, uh, and a better Europe. So thank again. thanks again once more for that very, very important endeavor for all of, of Europe. Um, the government uh, just uh, announced a few weeks ago its ninth support package to Ukraine. That the ninth package was actually 50% bigger than the eight ones that we have sent before because we're stepping up support for Ukraine. Uh, that is, of course, due to the Russian increased escalation. Then we in the West must step up. And in the ninth package, we provided air defense system and qualified the ammunition for also one more air defense system and also a rather comprehensive winter package. And rest assured, there will come more support from Sweden. This is about, of course, supporting Ukraine, but it's also investing into our own security. Uh, I must also say I find it very, very inspiring to, uh, to get a deeper understanding coming here and seeing it, but also meeting the Ukrainian people and the enormous resilience that is in, in, uh, among the Ukrainian people. I think that's really very, very inspirational for us, this historic endeavor that you, you're doing against uh, Russia's consistent violation of international law. And we see there's systematic abuse of human rights consistently of attacking uh, hospitals, attacking schools, university, Mikolaev. The, it was also very inspiring to hear the force commander of Mikolaev explaining how the defense of the city as well. Uh, so this is a, all a great source of inspiration. Just as the minister said, Sweden is taking over the EU Council presidency starting from January 1st next year. Then our top priority will be to support Ukraine. Uh, it will be a very important endeavor for us. And right now we're working with measures such as the European Peace Facility, but we also are very much engaged in the EU MAN Ukraine a training mission. In addition, Sweden also is active and uh, will continue being active in Interflex, which is a training mission in the United Kingdom. I had the pleasure of, of visiting uh, once a uh, few weeks ago. So once again, Minister Resnikov, thank you for a very good day today and for your leadership in, uh, in securing both Ukraine and, and Europe. And I think we're open for, for questions. Uh, I I would also like to add that tomorrow we will have a very important holiday. This is the holiday of the ground forces of Ukraine. And actually, recently we have celebrated the Day of the Armed Forces of Ukraine. And now we are going to celebrate the Day of the Ground Forces of Ukraine. And we have visited the Odessa Academy with Mr. Jonsson. We awarded our our military, both men and women. And these were not only the signs, but the watches and art. Uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Jonsson also welcomed uh, uh, those uh, who are in the academy. And this is very important for these people to be uh, welcomed by both ministers. And 200 years ago, uh, the Russian fleet uh, was defeated uh, in a very um, uh, important battle in the Baltic Sea. And actually, that was uh, from the Swedish um, naval fleet. So we continue these traditions uh, together with Sweden to fight against the Russian Empire. Thank you. So we can open the floor. Newsweek. What are the prospects of Ukraine receiving fixed-wing aircraft from the West, including but not limited to F-16s? And for what tasks are Ukrainian pilots already prepared to use these types of airplanes. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, we have um, technical, actually, to make technical breaks um, uh, for the um, interpreter to translate in both languages. So the question is about pilots and aircraft. There are two aspects. 
and uh, I hope uh, that we will be able uh, to receive these uh, from our partners uh, that will increase uh, uh, the capacity of um, our army. These are tanks um, and um, aircraft, airplanes, because now we mainly use uh, the Soviet weaponry against the army of the Soviet weaponry, so we are on the same level. But um, they just uh, have a bigger number of these units and ammunition. That's why they win over uh, with the numbers. That's why um, uh, we had already revolutionary changes when we got 150 artillery uh, from uh, our partners, uh, then MLRS and HIMARS, and also other modern anti-tank and anti-missile systems. Uh, different uh, times um, of uh, mobile air defense systems and love uh, Stinger, Star Trek, um, uh, or um, rocket propelled grenade, uh, Carl Gustav uh, produced by Sweden, etc. But um, to continue successfully liberating our territories, we of course need tanks uh, and um, planes and aircraft. Um, and today we will continue the discussion with our partners what types of uh, aircraft can be provided. Of course, uh, there are F-15, F-16 jets, but um, uh, the Kingdom of Sweden has uh, set up uh, the Gryphon aircraft which is also very efficient uh, and that can be efficiently used in combat. Uh, for me personally, there are no issue with training our pilots um, or tank operators uh, to use modern equipment. We have already demonstrated uh, that we know how to use NASAMS, IRIS team. Uh, we have uh, MLRS uh, M280, HIMARS uh, LRU from France. The counter battery radars uh, from Arthur to IPTQ. So we have coped with this. Um, uh, we are very efficient uh, with the, in terms of our fleet with harpoons. Uh, and I'm more than sure that uh, there is no issues on our side. I think um, that uh, there are the issues that have been considered by our partners, uh, not only from the point of view of training us, uh, uh, but um, to continue maintaining them. So here we're speaking about spare parts, about maintenance, repairs, and um, the more complicated systems like tanks um, uh, and aircraft, uh, the more difficult it is uh, to ensure the process. M777 or Halvitzer or Caesars, all these systems, um, of course, uh, will require maintenance and repair because um, only Ukrainian servicemen and Ukrainian nation can stand this. But uh, equipment requires maintenance and repair, and this is the only issue we have um, solved with this. Flying in Ukrainian skies with Ukrainian pilots in 2023. When I was for the first time in the United States in November last year, just after I was appointed, I had three visitors. I visited Stockholm when I met Mr. Johnson in Sweden, who was the head of the Defense Committee in the Swedish Parliament. So we've known each other from that time. Then I visited the United States and Israel, and there I asked Stingers. And they told me that it, that was impossible because of the legal and political points of view. But uh, in several months, uh, it became possible. That's why I believe that this is quite realistic, um, that um, in the next years we'll be able to obtain the modern systems uh, like jets and tanks. Do you want to add anything? Um, I'm proud that we have sent AT, AT4s, we have sent Carl Gustafs and NLOS that are produced in Sweden and they make a difference on, on the battle group, uh, on the battlefield, as you know, for being a, uh, not a very big country but rather a small, we still punch above our weight when it comes to our defense industrial base in Sweden and we have a lot of manufacturing of, of arms in, in Sweden. I think that is an advantage yes, these days when everybody's talking about in terms of security and supply and incrementally we have also escalated the, the support for Ukraine. I'm glad that our last package now included air defense systems because that's very high on, on the agenda due to of course the, the escalation of Russia attacking all over Ukraine with, with missiles and drones uh, which we in the strongest terms also condemn. So, so we're escalating our support to as, as Russia is escalating its war then we have to, in the West have to step up. The next question, please. 
The last straw, Luis, please. The floor is yours. Brazil. In Brazil, Pan American TV and Rede TV. Uh, to complement uh, uh, Michael's question, uh, how about the gripping, the gripping jet? Is it fit? Uh, it works with. Uh, um, it can. Well, it, it doesn't need uh, big airfields to operate. Uh, is it? Is it a good option for uh, for Ukraine? And um, and I would like also to talk about Melitopol. Melitopol was uh, uh, bombed by uh, Ukraine. Uh, how important is uh, freeing Melitopol uh, at this moment? Well, there there's no imminent plans for. Uh, for sending Gripen to uh, to Ukraine as so now I want to be clear on that but I think it's a it's a very good plane as I'm sure it also been the experience of Brazil and we we enjoy a strategic partnership with Brazil in regards to Gripen E and there's also many countries inside the EU who are also working with the Gripen CD and it's a cost efficient it has a good life cycle cost and and we and we were very proud of manufacturing it uh для нас має значення кожне for us, um, every Ukrainian city and town is important, especially those cities and towns that are still occupied. Because now here we talk about tactics and strategy of the general staff of the armed forces of Ukraine, um, how to attack an enemy, how to damage an enemy uh, to liberate uh, all temporarily occupied territories of Ukraine uh, till uh, the condition uh, as of 1991, when the borders of Ukraine were recognized um, on the international level. That's why Melitopol, Yalta, Sevastopol, and other cities are very important for us. We are going to liberate them. The next question, please. Suspilna. I have the question uh, to Mr. Reznikov. Um, what are your forecasts? Um, should we expect uh, the continuation of the attacks on the energy infrastructure of the Odessa Oblast till it's uh, fully damaged? And why is Odessa in its focus now, the Odessa region? I think um, that you're wrong saying that only the Odessa region is under attack now. This is not true. If you look um, uh, at the map of air alerts, uh, you can see that uh, the whole of Ukraine is uh, in the risky zone. The combat zone is the whole of Ukraine, including the western oblasts and regions of Ukraine. Uh, because ballistics and cruise missiles can reach the border with Poland, and you know this very well. And, um, and just that the latest case you know, when the Odessa infrastructure was damaged because uh, several drones uh, could um, attack and damage the infrastructure. But uh, this night uh, there was the air alert all over Ukraine and the drones were downed all over Ukraine. And um, the tactics of Russia, as I see it, uh, they cannot defeat the Ukrainian armed forces. Uh, they cannot um, be successful in the combat zone. That's why they try to fight this civil population. They want to bring us to darkness, uh, to cold uh, during winter time, for us to give up, uh, for us um, not to stand in one line, not to fight, and uh, to stop being, being resilient. As they see this, um, after that, uh, we will ask uh, uh, for negotiations. Uh, we will ask uh, the advocates uh, of uh, Kremlin uh, who dream of um, bringing us to the negotiations with the Kremlin on the conditions of the Kremlin. But uh, they will not be able to shake the boat. Uh, this is not the latest attack. But I would like to say that this war is the war of resources. And um, res resources are exhaustible on their side as well, including their missiles. We just um, need to continue being resilient. Of course, we will be victorious. Uh, and we will, uh, we will need to, to restore the infrastructure. And we need to live to learn how to be more efficient in how we use um, electricity. We need to learn how to survive, and we will definitely survive. Thank you. The next question, please. Do we have the next question? While we're thinking about the next question, I would like um, uh, to provide you some statistics. Uh, since uh, the 24th of February, the first day of invasion, Ukraine 
has been uh, visited by the um, ministers of defense uh, of our allies. 18 in general. Uh, Mr. Johnson is the 18th Minister of Defense visiting us since the date. Three ministers, Lithuania, Great Britain, and Estonia, have visited Ukraine several times, and this is not the first visit of the Minister of Defense in Odessa. We are always happy to see them. The next question, please. U.S. Director of National Intelligence Avril Haines said she expected to see both sides in the conflict, quote, refit, resupply, and reconstitute this winter. Um, she went on to say, we're seeing a kind of reduced tempo already of the conflict, and we expect that's likely to be what we see in the coming months, speaking about the winter. Do you agree with her assessment? No, more yeah. My personal assessment uh, is the following. The weather conditions, um, so we're now uh, transiting from the dry autumn uh, to winter, which is not still that cold. So we now have rainy weather and very difficult conditions for attacks from both sides uh, because um, the ground, the land uh, has been preparing to winter. That's why it is very wet and it is wet and it is very difficult uh, for the equipment uh, to uh, move on. And actually it is difficult uh, to walk in such conditions, because especially when it's come to walking, because um, our servicemen, they just have a lot of on them in terms of ammunition and, and other things. Uh, so now the situation uh, is more difficult because of the weather conditions. But um, our armed forces do not plan to stop. So you are waiting uh, for the ground uh, to be not that wet. And I believe uh, that we will continue our counteroffensive and the campaign to liberate our territories. Thank you. The Brazil TV again. Uh, Mr. Reznikov, uh, could you uh, tell, more, uh, tell us more about the international legion? Um, we had uh, uh, combatants uh, fighting for Ukraine for, from almost all Western countries, uh, including Sweden. Uh, uh, what to, how it was very important on the beginning, but now you have more soldiers from Ukraine. Is the international legion still important? How are you dealing with the international legion? Moya Dumka. I believe that uh, international legion and uh, the um, uh, possibility to buy to fight together with Ukrainians for the European. Uh, values uh, for the um, international values uh, has the ideological and political nature. This is the support of the countries. So this is the support of the population of the countries uh, who want uh, uh, in the combat uh, field uh, to, to protect the rule of law, to fight against the rule of force, because the Russians, they have destroyed the defense and safety system that was created after the Second World War, when one Fuhrer decided that he doesn't want to do anything with the world order. And now we have the new Fuhrer who has decided the same. That's why the international legion has this meaning for us. This is the support of Ukraine, because the potential of Ukraine in terms of mobilizing the human resources uh, is more than enough. Uh, for us, uh, it is important um, to have uh, the ammunition, to have weaponry for these human resources uh, to fight more efficiently. That's why with all ministers um, of defense, uh, we discussed 24 per 7 what weaponry uh, can be used uh, to make us stronger, air defense systems, uh, guns, uh, ammunition for artillery, etc. That's uh, why uh, when it comes to come back uh, to the international legions, uh, we have the um, representatives of different countries, they fight for their values. And this is also the exchange of um, experience. And let us be true, uh, today uh, when the NATO at the Madrid summit uh, has uh, decided, has recognized uh, that the main threat uh, for NATO countries uh, for the upcoming decade is Russia, the country that has uh, the best experience how to fight Russian army is the Ukrainian army. And that was the myth of the Second Army of the world. 
And uh, now we know that this is real if to properly use tactic strategy and the modern weaponry to defeat Russia. Uh, the Russians, they use the mid grider. They uh, don't spare the lives of their military, of their servants. And we need to, to use another tactics, uh, the precise tactics, precise use of weaponry. That's why the International Legion uh, also gets uh, this um, experience of modern war, not only conventional war, but the war of technologies. Drones against drones, uh, they are uh, in the air, on the ground, uh, on, in the water, electronic warfare, grab, etc. And I think uh, that this is the sense of the International Legion in terms of uh, the support of um, International Legion of Ukraine. And this is the win-win situation, as, as I said. Thank you. And the last question, please. My name is Irena Nazarchuk, and I have uh, the question to Mr. Reznikov. I have a short question. Uh, just uh, to add to what my, our, our international colleagues have mentioned. Um, the, uh, do the military of the International Legion have contracts uh, with Ukraine? And the second question is about winter. Uh, we do not know uh, what weather we should expect from this winter. And um, do uh, the um, military of the armed forces of Ukraine have uh, everything in terms of um, winter equipment? And armor. Yes, uh, the first question is yes, of course, there are contracts because um, if Ukrainians uh, work, um, uh, fight today under the um, law of Ukraine on mobilization, uh, the foreigners, uh, the foreign citizens uh, uh, can only do this uh, under the contract. Uh, they address uh, our diplomatic quorums uh, in their countries of residence for the first stage of communication, and then uh, if uh, the per a person uh, can really uh, conclude the contract, uh, then it communicates with our embassies uh, to train further in the training centers. If, uh, for the uh, winter clothes and ammunition, uh, we have uh, enough of stockpiles, enough of supplies. And uh, we have calculated uh, how many um, uh, winter clothes and ammunition uh, we had uh, at the time of invasion. And then we calculated um, how many reserves we have we had and how many we should also have and uh, during the summer we prepared uh, these um, winter kids when it comes uh, to winter jackets uh, shoes uh, we have uh, in three times more than the critical need I cannot speak about the precise numbers, but I can say that it is in three times more. So oh, now we are just preparing more of our stockpiles. If there is some lack um, at the front line in terms of the uniforms and ammunition, and then of course these are logistic uh, issues because of course it is very important for us, for the MNA, not to see uh, the supply chains. That's why we use uh, operative units um, to ensure all the supplies um, of uh, the front line. Uh, so uh, there are applications uh, to the logistics forces. And um, uh, we also have stockpiles in different er regions and uh, places of Ukraine uh, for further dissemination. But um, there is still a need, uh, and we tell this to our partners, in generators to ensure heating and electricity, tents. Uh, we need a lot of them because uh, we uh, try to properly allocate uh, and deploy our staff uh, uh, for them to be in tents uh, and not in some... Uh, and in the bar barracks. Uh, so we need heat and electricity. And in the framework of international support, international aid, we are able to get uh, this assistance. As General Mark Milley, our um, American colleague, then like of our Valery Zaluzhny, once told uh, that when you're at war, uh, there is always lack of everything. So there is always need in supplies. Thank you. Thank you. So as far as I understand, there are no more questions. Okay, just uh, a brief question from Newsweek. To the Ukrainian war effort, has the work of volunteers been? That goes for both Ukrainian civilians, businesses which feed the troops, collect warm clothing, and also international volunteers who connect with units to supply things like drones, um, um, 
those types of things. How important is the work of volunteers? I believe that Ukraine is a volunteer country in general, because in 2014 these were volunteers who were first to fight on the front line. The volunteers provided all the supplies, volunteers get to the government, and this is um, how we have changed our country uh, from the Soviet mentality to the modern democratic country. And uh, of course, uh, when there were first challenges, especially on the 24th of February, uh, there was um, a lot of lacking items um, in the armed forces of Ukraine. And volunteers were the first to respond, to react, because they are very flexible. These are people from businesses that know how to quickly conclude contracts and how to respond quicker. And uh, the state uh, is inflexible. And me, as the minister, I am limited, of course, by the proper uh, laws, uh, like uh, the um, control, uh, treasury, national bank, uh, uh, the uh, procurement, etc. That's why, um, of course, um, it took time for me. But uh, I was also allowed to, to use simplified procedures. But uh, we need time to provide vest, shoes, uniform. That's why volunteers were the first to respond. And um, they are the things that we should use in the future. I cannot spend um, uh, the um, state budget if there is no the procurement order. And uh, volunteers uh, who buy uh, UAVs, uh, drawings from the smallest and the biggest ones, uh, they give this uh, to our military and uh, they were the first uh, to meet the need. And we learn how to officially buy uh, these UAVs on behalf of the government. And uh, that's why we have the Day of Volunteer, the day before the Day of the Armed Forces of Ukraine. And I'm really very happy to award volunteers because they are very important for us. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your answers. And we are happy to see here both uh, the Ukrainian and uh, Minister of Defense and the Swedish Minister of Defense will finalize our briefing for today. Thank you for your attention. And we hope to see you soon. And we will continue our work with Mr. Jonsson. Thank you.